Overly Sarcastic Reductions and Lunch Summarize series did the Trojan War. Last time around, we checked out El Dorado from the same series and found out that it was based on a real place. This time around, we have a chance we're actually going to find out Troy was a real place. There's no way that happened. There was a movie about that. That doesn't happen in real life. It's like Atlantis or the Tooth Fairy. No one knows they exist or the Queen of England. Okay, maybe that joke was in bad taste. It was a reference, but... Ooh, maybe it's just a bit too soon. More importantly, there's a link below to the original video. Hit it up. If you haven't already, fix that. Do that. Glad we have this talk. Let's get started. Wrath. Sing, oh, oh goddess, that... of the wrath oh, of Peleus' yeah. son Achilles, murderous doom, yeah, who cost great, the think. Achaeans countless lives, hurling down to the house of Hades so many sturdy souls. Oh, is she quoting the Iliad? I've never actually read it because... It's poetry and I can't do poetry. Uh, getting the rhyme in my head always somehow throws me off. But more importantly, I recognize this, I think. The, I think so begins the there. Iliad, quite Hold possibly it! the most famous epic yeah, poem in the world. Right. It's a song, a tragedy, and a treatise on the destructive power of fury. It's no And also turned out to may or may not be a blueprint to the actual founding of Rome because crazy shit happened no one thought was real. Accident that the first word is menin, wrath. The Iliad is the story oh. of wrath, of Achilles, of the gods, of me and myself. For me, me and myself. I was going to make a comment about how it was wrath because it was literally, you stole my Helen, I'm going to steal your everything. I was going to make a joke in there, but that's actually a completely true statement about exactly how that went between Paris and Agamemnon stealing the wife Helen. Yeah, no, that, that would, yeah. What do you mean by myself, though? The Iliad is the story of wrath, of Achilles, of the gods, of me and myself for making it the first big project I illustrated on this channel, and thus by consequence, the worst video I've ever made that hurts. Oh. Oh, she's done this before? I need to find that. If anyone has a link, you'll have to drop it in Discord because I don't let anything go on YouTube because there's so many scam bots. But yeah, if you can, I'd appreciate that. Me to think about, even though it was a valuable experience without which the channel wouldn't exist as it. it is now. I see that so much. Loaded text, basically. And there's a reason it's so well liked. It's genuinely <laughs> an incredibly good story. Barring a few boat lists, it's a masterfully crafted ride. Boat absolutely lists? loaded oh, they up got with dramatic the irony and there, emotional yeah. stakes. But it's also just a thin slice of a much larger story. The Iliad takes place in the final days of the 10 year Trojan War. But the Trojan oh. War is a much bigger beast than just. So it's only the last 10 days. Huh. So that might actually not even touch on anything to do with Agamemnon at that point, which is weird because I thought he was mentioned in there. Homer retold. So today let's pull together a big pile of... Oh, dear God. The Aeneid. The, I don't know that. The Odyssey. And the Arestia. post Henerica, Cypria. Metamorphosis. Really? Ovid? Oh. Sophocles. That probably says Ajax. Bibliothetica. I recognize some of these and descriptions of Greece. I don't recognize just even more of them. Holy, she's not just doing a book. She's doing the Trojan War. Okay, yeah, the title makes a lot more sense now. It's not about the book. It's about all the books. Sources and talk about the bigger picture. Oh, the placement of dominoes that'll eventually topple into the Trojan War begins with the birth of Helen of Troy. Previously, oh. just Helen. This is also one of the pieces of the story that has the least consistency across different versions. Wow, you can tell the exact time period this was drawn. Because I'm going to go on a wild uh, limb here. I don't think that's how ancient Greece dressed. Could be mistaken, but I'm going to... Just, I think I'm right about that. Version, since practically speaking, all that matters is that she exists, not the specifics of where she comes from. In the Iliad and Odyssey, Helen is the daughter of the Spartan king Tyndareus and his wife Leda, and her brothers are Castor and Pollux, the deal. Oh, oh, Castor and Pollux. Oh, hello there. Who's the prettiest girl in the world? Careful with that talk, sweetie. Remember Psyche? Oh, yeah, because the entire thing about Greek drama, and I guess early Roman drama, was if you say something, the gods will hear and be little bitches about it. Dioscuri, a pair of badass horse-riding twins and the subject of the constellation Gemini. This family lineup is corrupt. I was wondering where they came from in Fate Grand Order, and now I know. This is what I get for not playing through that chapter. I'm just a little... Unarmed for actual history. That awkward moment where you realize you're actually relying on fake Grand Order and the general Nazuverse to give you actual historical details to just know about people in general terms and that it kind of works. I'm not sure how to feel about this.
corroborated in Sue Apollodorus's Bibliotheca with the additional detail that Leta's children are the result of a wild night where she slept with both Zeus and Tyndarius, with Zeus in the form of a swan, a concept that was bizarrely popular with Renaissance artists and purple. How many times did they do the swan thing with him? Like, I worked in an art museum. They had pictures of it. It was a little weird. Mostly because it wasn't the new stuff. It was just the swan there. And it wasn't this one, let's put it that way. But yeah, that, that's all over the place. Furries exist. Confirmed. Perverts of all stripes. This biological nightmare produced four children Magic with demigods. Pollux and Helen, the semi divine children babies. of Zeus, and Castor and Clytemnestra, Agamemnon's future wife and axe murderer, as the fully mortal children of Tyndarius. Helen's parentage continues to. Oh, yeah, I forgot how he died. Ah. Be disputed in the lost epic The Cypria, where it's suggested that Helen was adopted by Leda, but was actually the child of Nemesis, the Greek goddess of divine retribution for hubris. Now that kind of reframes the whole thing, doesn't it? Some of the it actually makes more sense that way, but let's be completely honest. It really does, but also at the same time, doesn't change much. These stories also state that Helen hatched from an egg on account of the whole Zeus was a swan at the time thing, and in Pausanias' descriptions of Greece, he describes a temple that contains... But but if he came from egg, but the swan's the one dropping the egg, so that per does that mean so, so goose did a male goose lay an egg in this version? You know what? I'm just going to roll off it. There's a lot of weird ones in the past. Let's just go with it. Shards of the eggshell that Lita supposedly laid. Look, I let a lot of this stuff slide, but that's okay, so weird, right? Anyway, skipping ahead a couple decades, huh. the next domino is the marriage of Helen. Helen is, according to some sources, the most beautiful woman in the world, and is thus unsurprisingly a very desirable bride. And a whole bunch of Greek kings roll up in Sparta to try and claim her hand. The exact roster varies a lot depending on who's telling it, but you better believe those stories. I just realized that there are multiple famous stories about Greeks, or the Greeks, and specifically Sparta. Troy, and because of a lot of historical references now, the 300th stand against the Persian Empire. Or I guess it would, yeah, it's really Persian at the time. And the Immortal Legion. I'm not, was it a legion? I don't actually remember. The Immortals. So on the one hand, it's madly men. On the other hand, it's literally the most beautiful men in the world. They literally just have Sparta typecast as the best people. Huh. I wonder if there's any others that kind of fall into that niche. Storytellers love them some tedious lists. Anyway, specifics aside, Tyndarius is pretty worried about having this many big personalities competing for his daughter out on his front lawn, and he's extra worried that picking one of them might make things exponentially worse and trigger a full-on war when... Foreshadowing... The rest of the suitors get cranky about being snubbed. Yeah. This is when one of the suitors sidles up to him, a young man by the name of Odysseus, and he offers to help Tyndarius resolve- Wait, Odysseus was involved this past? Oh! Shit, I was actually unaware of this completely. I thought you wanted to marry my daughter. Yes, but I'm also not stupid. It's kind of my whole thing. Yeah, his entire thing is he's actually just really smart. He's the Sherlock trope well before the Sherlock trope, uh, in the sense that he's a character who's really smart and doesn't make the idiot ball a thing. Solve his little suitor problem if he helps him with something else by putting in a good word for him with the Spartan king Icarius so Odysseus can woo his daughter Penelope. Tyndarius agrees and Odysseus. Operation Mutually Assured Destruction. <laughs> and of course it was a Tiffany's fault. And I just love how he's got that little just dead eye fish stare going like, yeah, what's up, dude? Uh, everyone else is like, bright eyed, wide, crazy eyed. This is great. I love this. He's just like, you're all idiots. I just sorry the representation just on something as simple as how the eyes are positioned is so fun to me. This suggests that Tyndarius make all the suitors swear a binding oath to protect the winner's marriage against any kind of interference, so that none of them can try to grab Helen and run off without the rest of them declaring war. The suitors ah, and because they probably stole him to Troy, everyone was obligated to help out based on that. Because even though that was to protect her and the students. It literally is a mutually assured protection pact that backfires and triggers the equivalent of a world war of the time period. I mean, granted, it was literally just a regional conflict, but I guess for the Greece world, it was, or the Greek world, it was the world war. Which is also literally how World War I started because it was mutually assured protection pacts and military alliances being triggered and drawing everyone into a fight in multiple different places after the assassination of the Duke. Huh. I mean, 
it's weird that it happened twice. I just did the meme. I, I just did the, the freaking doofenshmirtz meme. I'm just going to pretend I didn't and acknowledge that someone in the comments is going to go, oh, Harry, don't worry. It's not just been twice. It's been, and then just like a list of all of them. I don't mean make a list. I mean, they're going to like a list. Somehow they're going to make it in a circle. Just make a circle. This are going to make a circle. Wow. I am tired. Apparently. Yeah. I'm a spooning. A spooning. I can't speak today. Apparently either. But I'm assuming someone will do that because babe, honestly, the people in the chat who have information, I don't usually deliver it in really interesting ways. Suitors agree to the oath, and Tyndarius ends up choosing Menelaus for Helen, represented in absentia by Agamemnon, who must have been on his absolute best behavior to make that kind of a good impression, and the rest of the suitors pack up and go home. Though yeah, that is actually the most unbelievable thing. Everything I've ever heard about Agamemnon is that he is the literal equivalent of rich fuckboy, who then became rich asshole father-in-law. Not actually your father-in-law, but the one that's like, oh... Oh, you're literally going to pull out a shotgun and then actually just start shooting me when I'm not actually the one marrying your daughter. You just think I am. You're going to shoot me because I'm on your lawn. Why are we making reference to a daughter when you're just going to shoot me regardless? I don't know, but I felt like bringing out the shotgun and polishing a bit to scare you. That's the kind of conversation PC is. And yes, I'm actually aware. I'm still downplaying it how much of an asshole that guy apparently was. But not before Tyndarius keeps his word and arranges for Penelope and Odysseus to get together. In Euripides' Hecuba, the format of the oath is the same with the minor ch So what do you think? The redhead is cute. I'm not even going to try and say that. Well, want to know if he has a... Change that Tyndarius lets Helen choose her own husband, and she chooses Menelaus, very egalitarian. But meanwhile, somewhere completely different, the gods are setting up a domino of their own. According to Pseudopolidorus' Bibliotheca, Eris, goddess of it's getting a little too chummy around here, wakes up one morning and chooses violence. Paradise lost? I can't quite read that in the background or see it. Chaos Reza... Oh, reigns. It's lobbing an apple at Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera, and saying it's a prize for whichever one of them is the most beautiful. The Roman author oh, Hyginus adds a little more detail. In I'm sorry, just that, that, just the faces Hera right and here. saying it's a prize for whichever one of them is the most beautiful. Like, all of them. Yeah, she, is that eyes or no, it's just the, uh, it's just the corners. And then her in the background with the kitty face and everything, just the smug assholery. Oh, wow. Beautiful. The Roman author Hyginus adds a little more detail in his text Fabulae by specifying that this is happening at the wedding of Achilles' parents, and Eris is pissed she didn't get an invite. Zeus recognizes disaster when he sees it and quickly has Hermes tow the goddesses somewhere very far away to work things out, so he takes- Wait, is this a random case of Zeus not being at fault, or Zeus being at fault by making admittedly the correct choice? I don't know. Hey, kiddo, you like objectifying women? It's one of my top three skills. It's in the Mount Ida, where Trojan Prince Paris is hanging out. Paris about... has had an eventful childhood of his own at this point. In Hyginus' Fabulae again, it's briefly mentioned that Paris's mother Hecuba had a dream where she gave birth to a burning torch that exploded into snakes, and everyone agreed that was a bad omen and a half. So when the baby was born, they handed him off to a servant to kill him. The servant... What is with everyone just leaving kids to kill who are princes? Oh, because what I'm thinking about is the Roman story with Romulus and Remus. And considering Rome is based on Troy, uh, survivors traveling from one to the other, it's covered in the Aeneid. It, yeah, it's probably a translation of the myth over time from the Greek version to the Roman version. They're probably related, actually. Huh. chose the much more humane option of dumping him on a mountain to die, but luckily he's rescued by some shepherds who hey, take him in. A few years and several shenanigans later, Paris reclaims... He's my long lost brother. Normally we don't believe Cassandra, but that's totally plausible. Wait, they actually believe Cassandra? I didn't know people were actually allowed to do that. Huh. Claims his status as prince and everyone accepts him back with open arms because it's probably fine, right? It'd be crazy if this random kid was single-handedly responsible for triggering the downfall of Troy. Anyway, that's been Paris's life so far. And meanwhile, back in the present, her... I would love to see right now if someone actually made a story going back in time, doing like one of those historical dramas. And the entire reason no one believes Cassandra is because she was massively wrong about Paris and everyone doesn't let her forget it. Would that be stupid and a completely silly story? Yes. And I would still love it because it's a stupid and completely silly story. That's literally my thing. Hermes tells him to pick which goddess gets the apple. Each goddess offers Paris an incentive to vote for her. Hera promises to make him king of the world, Athena offers him glory and victory in battle, and Aphrodite promises him Helen as his wife. Paris chooses Aphrodite and sails off to Sparta to collect his already- So, now we kill him, right? We can be much more creative than that. Yeah, let's kill a lot of other people, too. 
Uh, this is why you just randomly give it to Zeus and say, I'm in the dudes. I mean, you're still gonna get fucked, but at least this way it might not kill everyone else at the same time. Pretty married prize while Hera and Athena start plotting okay, revenge. In the Cypria, the story continues with Paris and company first hosted by the Dioscori and then by Menelaus and Oh, the Dioscori there too. So what brings you to Sparta? Sampling the local color? Oh, it's a reference to wine. And then by Menelaus. I'll entertain our guests until you return. Uh, just... Hmm. It's kind of cute, then. Like, all cutesy, and he's got the hearts, and she's just like, aww, the intertwined. It's about to get fucked up, isn't it? Ah, uh, yay, mastering. And Helen, when Menelaus has to leave for Crete, Aphrodite intervenes to get Helen and Paris together, and they load up Paris's ships with stolen treasures and sail off into the night. Despite a storm sent by a pissed off Hera, possibly due to her role as the goddess of marriage, Paris and Helen make it to Troy and are married. However, this. The future of Troy is looking bright, and Cassandra in the background just screaming. Yeah, she's got the right of it. This version of the story isn't quite universal. In Euripides' play Helen, the Helen that Paris brings to Troy and marries is actually an illusion crafted and brought to life by Hera, while the real Helen is brought to Egypt to keep her safe during the war. Pseudo Apollo. The fuck? Bibliot. This is a version I have literally never even heard of. I want to hear that again. I just love your noteworthy feature. Ah, babe, that's so thoughtful. ...and brought to life by Hera, while the real Helen is brought to Egypt to keep her safe during the war. Pseudo-Apollodorus' Bibliotheca also mentions this version, so it must have been decently well known. Anyway, the questionably... This is going to be a silly thing to say, but I'm not actually sure how aware of alternate landmasses they were at the time. I mean, Persia, Greece, they were pretty well known. But I'm not sure if anyone was on... The Romans, oh, these were books written much later, so they were probably pulling from myths back when the world was a little more connected. Although I thought at this time period the world was starting to get more connected due to trade routes. I don't actually know if that would be a story that had come down from the time period of when the Trojan War happened, or just added on much later due to more increased trading and shipping across longer distances of the Mediterranean. This is one of those things I'm probably going to end up spending way too much time wiki-walking on tonight. Eh, screw it. Who needs sleep? The consensual abduction of Helen kicks off the next big step in the process, namely the mustering of armies. See, all of Helen's former suitors are still bound... Yes, I do love me some mustering of armies in Greece. This is so Greek. I mean, just look at all of the Greek people here. Yeah, it it's... The style is just classic, man. Yeah, because there's a lot of really weird paintings where people didn't know what the heck they were looking at, and they knew the people they were painting for and commissioned to paint for had no idea what they were requesting. So then when they said something out of history, they would draw whatever the fuck they want and tell their patrons it was. There are some very disturbing examples when they say, draw a line, and they just drew a person's face on a cat's body, and it is the most fucked up thing ever. And by the way, I'm specifically referencing a art in the religious historical section from the Dark Ages in the Pittsburgh Oakland Museum of Na Fine Arts. Yeah, it's connected to a natural history museum. I was about to say that first. But if you can go there, it's the Carnegie Natural History and Art Museum. It has the specific painting I'm looking at, and there is a fucked up cat with a human face, and it's supposed to be a lion. It is weird as hell, man, because that's just how art went. I don't know what I'm drawing. You don't know what you're asking for, but you'll pay me regardless. And there's a lot of other little things that we do in there, but just ways to make money and show favor by just putting in random bullshit that no one actually was really going to pay attention to. But the person who was pointed out to would love and spend way too much money on. ...by that oath to defend her marriage. So pretty much every important Greek king is now honor-bound to go storm the gates of Troy and get yep. Helen back. And the Cypria, Menelaus is informed of Helen's loss by the goddess Iris and returns home to get Agamemnon to start mustering an army. They I'm sorry, is this actually a picture showing a goddess was actually intimidated by Menelaus. <laughs> Sir, I'm just the messenger. thought that was Hermes. Also, really cool art for that one. Damn. An army. They go collect the various Greek kings who are honored. Let's remind these men of their duty and wage glorious battle with Troy. Oh, no. Bound to side with them. And also Achilles, who unlike... Did somebody say glorious battle? Oh, my God. The rest of them doesn't actually have to be there since he was too young slash too not even born yet to be one of Helen's suitors. So what? he's not bound by the oath. Oh, it's okay. referenced briefly in the Iliad. I thought they were going to say he was not born yet during the actual part of the war, but that would be weird. 
Destiny will be cruel, my beautiful son. Will you die with spear in hand or live to see yourself forgotten? I'm seven. Yeah. Funny thing is, this exact point right here is referenced later on in Dante's Inferno. No, actually, I think it was the Agamemnon. Yeah, it was the Agamemnon where it was seeing him after he was dead and him ruminating on the fact that he regretted his life because he wished he had lived a long and peaceful life as opposed to burning out and dying because dying is horrible. And then this version, I think, is going more with the burn bright and be glorious because everyone fucking dies and it sucks. I'm heavily paraphrasing, but it's kind of funny how the different people have taken different takes on it. Yeah, and this was the one from the Iliad, so it's the more pro-glory in short life as opposed to pro-long life in obscurity is better. Interesting takes. That Achilles' mother Thetis prophesied that if he went to Troy, he would definitely die there, but his name would be remembered forever. But if he stayed out of it, he'd live a very long life, but die in obscurity. Yep. He chose to join the Greek kings and storm Troy okay, for the immortality of glory, back. not because he had to be there. In contrast, Odysseus does have to be there, but really, really doesn't want to be there. And again, Odysseus is the best person ever. Darling, please come out of the box and greet our guests. Absolutely not. It is actually a freaking shipping bug with the arrow on it. There. In the years since the marriage of Helen, he uh. and Penelope have gotten married and had a baby son. So now he has a lot to lose. In order to escape his own oath, he pretends to have gone mad, but gives it up when Agamemnon threatens his son. Because oh, wow. Agamemnon won your ass, too. Who's <laughs> in order to escape... So, as you can see, my husband is in no condition to fight. Do do do, salt to my field. Uh huh, interesting. With his own oath, he pretends to have gone mad, but gives it up when Agamemnon. He seems fine to me. What is wrong with you? A very huge amount. I did not realize Odysseus played so much of an early part of this. I only know him for the Odyssey. Oh, and there's the knife threatening the sun. Yeah, yeah. So many issues would have been solved if Odysseus just killed Agamemnon right now. I'm not sure which they are. Mostly because I actually forgot now that I think about it. Huh. You know, I used to actually be a huge buff about what the fuck he did. I don't know why. Oh, because I spent way too much time staying up way too late and watching it and reading it and reading more and then reading transcripts. And, you know, considering how into this time period I was, it's kind of weird that I actually never did read any of these novels or, well, I guess poetry books. The Iliad, the Odyssey. Yeah. Weird. Agamemnon threatens his son because Agamemnon's a real piece of shit. Who knows? Yeah. The gang reluctantly muster at Aulis and prepare to sail for Troy. None of that Agamemnon attitude. pisses off Artemis for no reason and she sets the wind against them. Euripides' oh, no, tragic play home. Iphigenia in Aulis recounts this part of the timeline. The only way to appease yeah. Artemis is for Agamemnon to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia, which he feels briefly bad about and then does almost immediately. However, in the Cypria, Artemis actually spirits Iphigenia away and makes her... And I thought my dad was bad. I mean, he is, but... Yeah. Mortal, replacing her on the altar with a deer, which is nice of her. With Artemis appeased, the wind turns and the fleet can officially sail for Troy. The surviving summaries of the Cypria explain in brief what happens when they arrive in Troy. A few minor skirmishes happen, the Achaeans send a message to Troy demanding the return of Helen and the stolen treasure, Troy tells him to get stuffed, and the war begins. Achilles pretty much single-handedly- Wow, this is awesome, and he's just loving it. Sacks the surrounding towns and the Achaeans besiege Troy. This part of the process evidently takes about nine years, but it's not- Maybe if we are really quiet, they'll go away. Shut it, Paris. Oh, my God. And years of ferocious ass-kicking that basically destroys every part of Troy that's not safely behind the walls. Yeah. Zeus decides to get the Trojans a break and works out a plan to take Achilles out of the equation for a little while, and that's how we get the Iliad. To very quickly speed through it, during the raiding around Troy, most of the Achaeans picked up bride prizes. They picked up... Oh, no. At the Iliad. To very quickly speed through it, during the raiding around Troy, most of the Achaeans picked up bride prizes, which was a nice way of saying enslaved Trojan women for them to bone. Achilles' bride prize is Briseis, a character. To be honest, I'm not even sure why I'm here. Oh, yeah, the relationship. Ah. Uh. Character with basically no character who, surprisingly, does seem to actually get along okay with Achilles and Patroclus. She's very upset when Patroclus dies, spoiler alert, and mentions that he promised to make Achilles marry her when they returned from Troy. While Agamemnon's bride prize is Chryseis, the daughter of Chryses, a Trojan priest of Apollo. Chry oh yeah, <laughs> the priest thing. My wife will be fine with it. She was great about the Iphigenia thing. Yeah, I think at this point, if she stabbed Agamemnon... His wife would also be fine with it. In fact, she would probably prefer that. Not being married to him and someone else taking care of him for him. 
or she could be jealous because someone else took care of him for her. Oh, Gracie tries to buy his daughter's freedom with a kingly. This ransom is more than enough for one person's freedom, but knowing you've lost her forever is priceless. Oh my God, the actual sheer assholery here. It's just actually perfectly historically accurate to him. Ransom, but Agamemnon as as tells Crises he's going to enjoy making sure Crises is too busy boning him and making him sandwiches to ever see her homeland again. Crises prays to Apollo uh, for help, and Apollo deems Agamemnon a huge dick weasel and rain. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Things I did not expect to have Red say. A huge dick weasel. <laughs> I don't. I wonder how loud I could go because my wife's in the other room right now and I just I should have closed the door but I don't want to bother getting up right now see your homeland again crises prays to Apollo for help and Apollo de Lord Apollo I wait don't tell me it's the house of Atreus again oh uh, yes every time oh his last name was Atreus because in Dune they said they had the lineage from Agamemnon and then carried it through by having everyone in that house be somewhat insane and psychotic yeah, Leto is cool, and his dad was cool, and everyone after him was batshit insane. Deems Agamemnon a huge dick weasel and rains divine arrows down on the Achaeans, killing a whole bunch of them. The Achaeans figure yeah. out Agamemnon pissed off Apollo. You just can't help yourself, can you? And it's freaking Odysseus. Hey, I kidnapped her fair and square. Her dad's the one who made it weird. I don't need <laughs> oh my god, just this is Oh sorry. <laughs> uh everything here could have been solved so much faster if they just listened to Odysseus the entire time or they just listened to Cassandra. Frankly, I'm honestly surprised there's no buddy cop show that someone made at this point. Just like a random one shot anime out there. Odysseus and Cassandra, buddy cops in. Why the fuck aren't you listening to us? Okay, note to self, I should probably write that down. Maybe pitch it as a plot. That would be a stupid show that I think we actually probably could do a season. It's all coming together now. Apollo by dishonoring his priest, and the only way to make him stop killing everyone is to give back Chryseis, which Agamemnon refuses to do unless he's given a replacement slave woman right now, because obviously that's so much more important than winning the actual war he's there to win. Yeah. So he takes Chryseis from Achilles. This royally antagonizes Achilles, so he bundles up in his sulky blanket burrito and hides in his tent while the Oh, and this is right after his dad died, or not dad, sorry, his friend died, so, yeah. What is your problem? What you gonna do, huh? Gonna kill me about it? If we're lucky, yes. Achilles. This royally antagonizes Achilles, so he bundles up in his sulky blanket burrito and hides in his tent while the Achilles... Oh, God's... Oh, what? Oh, I... It feels like it's a reference, but I just don't know what it is. Achilles get absolutely slaughtered without him. With Achilles off the field, the Trojan hero Hector... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, hey, I just remember something. You have literally no authority over me because he was there willingly. Yeah. There's nobody to counterbalance him, so the Trojans actually start winning for a change. Long story short. Wow, I've gotten really good at this. Oh, no. But that's basically how things continue until Patroclus is killed by Hector and Achilles' grief and rage find. Oh, this is... Ah, Patroclus died later. Oh, my mistake. He, just his beloved boyfriend. Uh, so it wasn't after he was dead, it was before he was dead. Ah, I got that wrong, and that makes a lot more sense now. Story short, that's basically how things... See? I just killed Achilles. Easy! ...continue until Patroclus is killed by Hector, and Achilles' grief and rage finally motivate him to rejoin the battle, at which point he pretty much immediately kills Hector and completely turns the tide of the war. And yeah. that's basically the Iliad, minus a couple Metal Gear jokes. The events after the Iliad Metal are Gear recounted jokes. in a few places, one of them being Quintus Smyrnaeus's post-Homerica, which covers the death of Achilles and the final days of the Trojan War. It also features an ass-kicking Amazon princess, Penthesilia. Wait, Penthesilia was in this one? What the hell? I came here to flee the Furies and kick ass, and the Furies are inescapable. Wouldn't that mean that you also have to now stop kicking ass because you still have to run? Eh? The death of Achilles and the final days of the Trojan War. It also features an ass-kicking Amazon princess, Penthesilia, daughter of Ares, who rolls up to Troy, pursued by the Furies for accidentally killing her sister, and decides to sublimate her many, many issues by slaughtering as many Achaeans as she can get her hands on, which she does so effectively it briefly sparks an honest-to-God feminist revolution in the Trojan women. Achilles isn't there to stop her because he's too busy crying on 
I love everything about this. And just him randomly be on the side crying, missing the entire warrior woman entering part. Although, wasn't Achilles the one to kill her, or...? Top of Patroclus' grave, but when he catches wind of the slaughter, he gears up, heads to the battlefield, right and back. kills her in one hit. But this doesn't improve his mood. I'm sorry, what? It's just the sheer... Mood. But when he catches wind of the slaughter, he gears right up, back. heads to the battlefield... No! I shall succeed where Hector failed! Oh, yeah, wow. And he's just the sheer done with it look. Killed and kills her in one hit. But this Dead. doesn't improve his mood. As when he removes her helmet, he finds Penthesilea stunningly beautiful and immediately regrets killing her, instead imagining the life they could have shared if they'd met. I know this sounds like self-insert fan fiction, but a spicy baby Jesus is my witness. This is what happens? Okay, one, I actually know about this from Fake Grand Order because apparently it was a good reference. I'm still getting over that. Two, what is spicy baby Jesus? Because there's a lot of keywords in there that I've seen in a lot of different places and not in that combination. I'm kind of terrified to find out what exactly they meant there because the first thing I can think of is that one buddy cop anime where it was Buddha and Jesus in a house together. And before you say that's just another dumb thing I've thrown out on video. No, that's an actual anime you can find. I don't remember what it's called, but it is a legitimate thing that is real. Apparently from what I heard, it's actually very funny. Need to watch it still. Bet under literally any other circumstances. The Achaean warrior Thersides pops up to make fun of him for being a lame girl like in weenie pants, and Achilles smacks him so hard he dies. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, later on we get the death of Achilles, which is unfortunately very inconsistent across its many sources. Oh? The Post America, for instance, credits his death to Apollo himself, who violates Zeus's dubiously enforced no interference policy and shoots Achilles in the heel with a poisoned arrow. In pseudo Apollodorus. I mean, Apollo would make more sense just because he already fucked them over a lot. And it's like residual Agamemnon needs to die and you're the best warrior he has. Take the shot. Flack. Ah! Or thong. This is Bibliotheca. Meanwhile, Achilles is shot in the heel by Paris being guided by Apollo. And in Ovid's Metamorphoses, Paris shoots Achilles with Apollo's help, but they're being motivated by Poseidon, who's pissed as hell that Achilles killed one of his sons earlier in the war. In the yeah, that, yeah, he probably killed a lot of people. My brother will see you dead. That's fair. Considering what I'm going to do to you, oh jeez. Iliad, Hector prophecies that Achilles will be killed by Paris with Apollo's help, so that's probably the most generally consistent version, but ultimately the how doesn't matter so much. All that matters is Achilles dies in Troy, just like his mother prophecies. It's also interesting Achilles to note heel? that none of these versions specify that Achilles' heel is his only weakness or that he's indestructible everywhere else. And oh? while that's a fun bit of folklore, it seems to have popped up after Homer and isn't really part of the original Trojan oh. cycle. But it's still cool, so, you know, whatever. Fun fact, according to... That's actually even more badass because, like, on the one hand, superpowers he can't be hit is pretty awesome. On the other hand, the initial thing is he's just so damn good, he doesn't need to be invincible because no one's going to get close enough to test it. That's admittedly more badass. It's like the difference between, and I'm going to make a very geeky reference here, being a super saiyan or going full ultra instinct. One is power. The other is fuck you, I win. Which admittedly is actually both of them, but one just has better music attached to it. During Sophocles' play Ajax, this is also where Ajax dies after he loses to Odysseus at the funeral games for Achilles' armor and kills himself in shame. Fun. The post-Homerica also explains himself, how though. Paris dies. Embarrassingly. He's shot by Philoctetes with two poisoned arrows, one of which hits him in the dick, which I think oh! we can all agree is the true villain of this story. Paris. Yeah, it would have saved a lot of issues. Please, my love, that can't be right. My name's not Helen. What? tries to get his wife Oinoni, a nymph, to heal him, but she's pretty livid. I'm sorry, you had a nymph for a wife. Already married, and then you did all this other shit. Nymphs, who are supposed to be supernaturally beautiful. Missed that part. Wow. Yeah, no, she's making the right of this one. Yeah, he deserves it. He abandoned her for Helen and refuses, so he dies. And Priam is too busy. Oh, to all, Prince Paris has died. I love all my children equally who are named Paris, and I should have given up the other one instead. Whatever her name is, Meg. Morning Hector to notice. I feel bad for the guy, but I don't. Anyway, with almost all the major players dead, the war winds down, culminating in the final domino, the Trojan horse. This part of the story is... Ooh. Aeneid and the Odyssey, yeah. Major that players dead, really the war winds down, though. culminating in the final domino, the Trojan horse. It actually does look like a horse on this one, wow. I like how you could see the lines in, so they still made it look like it was fake, but they did a really good job of making it look like an actual horse. It's the most realistic thing in here. Just really good art. 
Very old, but very nice. This part of the story is recounted in detail in both the Odyssey and the Aeneid, though the Aeneid goes into a little more detail. With Athena's help, the Greeks build a massive wooden horse and several of them hide inside, while the rest burn their camp and sail away to make the Trojans think they're retreating. The Trojans mm -hmm. are overjoyed that the siege is finally over and swarm out of the city and into the abandoned camp, finding it empty except for this giant wooden horse. There's a lot of debate over what to do with it, and one dude, Laocoon, a We've been fighting Odysseus for 10 years and you people still can't smell a trap. Wait, is he literally the only person who figured that out? Wow. Seer and priest of Apollo is actually appropriately worried about this seemingly spontaneous retreat and yells that they should really know Odysseus's tricks by now. He even hucks a spear into the side of the horse to make his point. The Trojans also- <laughs> I'm sorry, I love that thing. <laughs> just that look right there. I kind of like this guy because he's literally just completely done with this shit. And the one person who's calling him out because they know it's his bullshit. And I just, I'm sorry. I love this interpretation of him being just like, ah, fuck, we're going to get done. It, yeah, yep, yeah, doing it. Yep. Oh, uh, this is probably my favorite interpretation of any media there is. The Trojans also find and capture one remaining Achaean, a dude named Sinon, who spins a very compelling sob story about being left behind as a sacrifice paralleling Iphigenia to allow the rest of the Achaeans to sail home. The horse, he explains, was built to win back favor from Athena. Not cool with the war crimes, dude. Will a nice horse make you feel better? Oh my god. And yeah, he actually probably would do that if it wasn't a lot. ...was furious at Odysseus and Diomedes for stealing her sacred statue, the Palladium, from Troy. Sinon warns the Trojans that because the horse is very definitely Mega sacred to Athena, sacred. they absolutely cannot destroy it or damage it in any way, but if they take it into the city, it might bring them the same good fortune that the Palladium used to. And to really sell the bit, the gods send a bunch of snakes to kill Laocoon and his sons. Ah, this only proves my point about how suspicious this is. Yeah. Thoroughly convinced that damaging the horse is a very bad idea, the Trojans lug it into the city. That You've doomed us all! Oh, learn a new tune. Yeah, seriously, Cassandra, you, you just needed to, like, surrender to them at this point. Granted, you probably would have been stuck with Agamemnon, so probably it's still better to die here than anything else. It's safer that way. Naturally, over Cassandra's protests, and that night, Sinon unlocks the horse and releases the war. Uh, why did none of our seers and priests of Apollo warn us? Hmm, I wonder why. So it wasn't even just Cassandra they ignored. They literally ignored everyone telling them they're being idiots. Within, ...who swarm out and sack Troy, burning it to the ground. The version in the Odyssey is very similar, but it's recounted from Menelaus's perspective inside the horse, and he adds oh. that Helen was suspicious of the horse and went around the outside knocking on it, addressing the Achaeans by name while impersonating the voices of their wives, which is pretty devious. Odysseus just barely managed to keep the others from blowing their cover... Okay, one? Holy shit, Helen's badass in this one. That is a really good verse. Not just because... One, think you'd do that ahead of time. Smart. Two, that she would know their wives and know how they sound and could impersonate them. Damn. Thank goodness for this incredibly comprehensive boat list. Pieces of their wives, which is pretty devious. Odysseus just barely managed to... Won't you come out and keep me company tonight? Hope she's worth it, bud. God. Keep the others from blowing their cover through basic logic and the occasional application of CQC. The horse plan works, the Achaeans successfully sack <laughs> Troy, and it's a happy ending for everyone. Kind of. Really, it's a happy ending for almost no one. Between the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's one more lost epic called the Nostoi, a text Ooh. so fragmentary we only have five and a half lines from it. Oh, it hurts. Anyway, the Nostoi seems to have told the story- Wait, we know the book exists, there's only five and a half lines. Like, has nothing else been discovered? Are we, like, not entirely sure? How old is this video? It's a year old. Yeah, no, there's definitely nothing new. Holy shit. Sorry. The idea of lost text that we know exists and have information about this time period. This is, this is treasure hunt material for me right now. And it's so freaking cool. Alrighty. Good work, team. Please stop talking. Do you think Athena's mad about the war crimes? Nah. Um, yeah, you're all screwed of the various surviving Greek heroes returning home from Troy, minus our boys Odysseus and Aeneas, of course, who get their own elaborate epilogues later on. This is an important intermediate bit that most of the later stories technically serve as sequels to. For instance, Aeschylus' Oresteia follows after Agamemnon returning oh, home, and Gordon. the Odyssey, Telemachus visits Menelaus after he made it home with Helen, a story that's partially recounted in Euripides' play Helen. But at this point, the Trojan War is basically fully wrapped up. 99% of everyone is dead, Troy's been burned to the ground, Agamemnon's about to get murdered, and all is finally right with the if world. That you know, earlier. I bet when Odysseus was stuck out in Troy fighting for 10 long years and then when he was lost at sea for another 10 years he probably really appreciated the irony that the whole mess was technically his fault yeah yeah 
just invoke mutually assured destruction. Works every time. And technically it did, because it would have caused a war if he hadn't done it sooner, because that is exactly what would have happened. Yeah. It is actually all his fault, though. <laughs> because everyone didn't listen to him every other time, except for the one time where it screwed them all over. <laughs> oh, that is actually amazing. I, I love every second of this. And everyone's competing for a love they want. Oh god, there's even more information? How much did she just hold back on? In some versions, Zeus orchestrates the war to combat overpopulation, which is kind of a stupid idea I would expect Zeus to come up with. Yeah, especially since the follow-ups to that probably would have been the plague, and that was way more effective. Boatless, my beloved, is what this is bloated. Helen is such an interesting character for your interpretation because her role in the war is both centralized and inconsistent. Did she cause it by running off with Paris willingly? Was she abducted? Was she cursed by Aphrodite to fall for Paris? Did she love Paris, Menelaus, both? Was she even at Troy at all? Which is probably the weirdest one because I had never heard of that before. It's kind of fascinating that's one of the takes that it does exist. Please. At least she and Menelaus are doing okay by the time... But Odysseus rolls around? Yeah, 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 yeah. Congratulations to Menelaus, Menelaus on dodging the curse of the house of Atreus just by being proximate to Agamemnon, who is so eminently hateable, the curse lasered in on him instead. So I'm just kind of curious at the end. It mentioned that Menelaus was the Atreus who dodged the curse there, and Agamemnon got it by just being such a dick that the curse, like, would you be solid to hit him instead? But does that mean that it was actually Menelaus who was the Atreus and that's based on what Dune did? Or did Dune have it wrong? Because I'm pretty sure they did reference Agamemnon as the person they told their lineage from. I don't actually know, but considering Dune would have been written in a time period prior to the discovery, or probably pretty close to, or if not slightly before the discovery of the Trojan ruins, maybe it was just thrown in the air and it's like, eh, close enough, it's not like it's real. I don't know. I'm actually really curious. If someone does know, I've been asking it a lot this video, but let me know down in the comments below because I'm just really curious. Frankly, every time I ask, people actually do answer. It's freaking amazing, man, because there's just so many little bits and pieces and details. And I'm like, I didn't know this. This is cool. I geek out finding those comments and it's absolutely a, just a massive blast for me. So for everyone who did that before in all the previous videos, thanks. I don't always get to the comments or respond because I'm massively socially awkward. So looking at a comment, it's like, this is awesome. Followed by, oh, I need to reply. I, Paddock attack, dead. It got better, but it's still kind of terror inducing. So, yeah, basically, what I'm saying is for everyone who replied, thanks. For everyone who watched, thanks. And I'll see you guys in the next one. You know the deal, though. Link below, original video. Hit it up. It's super, I was going to say super eye patch well, because I've seen so much of this stuff recently. Wow. No, overly sarcastic productions. Hit them up. You know they're good. You've probably already done it, but do it anyways. Do it a second time, even. I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.